This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Captivology, The Science of Capturing People's Attention by Ben Parr. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 5, The Reward Trigger. A few years ago, I was dining with a group of tech industry friends at an upscale restaurant in San Francisco. Our out-of-town friend, Milana, had come to visit us, but despite the fact that we rarely got a chance to see her, none of us were paying much attention to her. Instead, we were locked in a constant staring match with our smartphones, texting, scanning Twitter, emailing, checking in on Foursquare. That's when Milana suggested we play the phone stacking game. Each of us placed our iPhones and Androids on top of each other. Milana, being the workaholic nerd she is, put three phones in the pile. None of us were allowed to look at our phones. The first one to touch the pile had to pay for the entire table's tab. Nobody touched their phones for the rest of the night. Our attention had instantly transferred from our vibrating devices to our vibrant conversation. And I have been su suggesting the phone stacking game at group dinners ever since. Approximately 70% of managers say they check their phones within an hour of waking up, and 56% say that they check their phones within an hour before bed. Here's a crazier stat, though. The average person check their, checks their smartphone 110 times per day. Sadly, I probably check my phone twice as often. We're becoming a society addicted to our smartphones. Actually, it's not the smartphone itself which is that addicting. The real culprits are the email, text, and app notifications because they grab our attention by triggering a complex mechanism in our brain that powers our motivations and desires. It is this mechanism that makes us pay attention to everything from our smartphones to the McDonald's arches. But how does this mechanism work, and how can you harness it to capture attention? Here's how. The Reward Mechanism All animals, humans included, are creatures developed specifically for accomplishing goals and seeking rewards. Sex allows us to procreate and rewards us with pleasure. Hunting allows us to find food and is rewarded with sustenance. Solving a difficult puzzle rewards us with personal satisfaction. Our body is constantly training us to develop certain habits that it thinks are either pleasurable or beneficial to our well-being and survival. Eating a delicious treat like a chocolate brownie, for example, seizes our attention for the same reason clearing our phone's notifications makes us feel better. Our brain rewards us for these behaviors. I suspect most of you are familiar at some level with dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter in the brain that helps send signals or block signals to nerve cells. Most people have heard that when dopamine is released in the body, it stimulates pleasure centers in the brain, causing us to feel happiness while we eat a cupcake, or relief when we reach inbox zero. But this perception of dopamine is a misconception. As we learned in chapter one, recent research has shown us that while dopamine is related to pleasure, it doesn't actually cause pleasure. Studies have shown that if you take dopamine away from a rat, it will still feel pleasure. What it will lose is its motivation to do anything pleasurable. In fact, a rat without dopamine won't even be motivated to eat. If you suppress dopamine, says Dr. Kent Barrage of the University of Michigan, an expert in neuroscience and the brain systems that control motivation, pleasure, and reward, you suppress the attractiveness of all rewards. He also told me that there are, in fact, two key systems involved in rewarding us for desired behavior. The first system, wanting, is the system that gives us the motivation to act and is powered by dopamine. It gives us desire. When you crave a cupcake, sex, or a drug, dopamine is flowing through your brain. On the other hand, the second system, liking, is the system that actually rewards us with pleasure and satisfaction, completing the reward cycle. Liking is controlled by another set of neurotransmitters known as opioids. This dual system for rewards explains why we're obsessed with our phones. Imagine you're locked in a room for an hour, and you have only two options to pass the time. You can either play with your phone, or you can solve a complex jigsaw puzzle. Which one do you think you're going to spend more time playing with? Sure, you might try the jigsaw puzzle, but as soon as that phone vibrates, you're going to check to see what notification just popped up on the phone. Is it an email? A news article? A tweet? 
Dopamine is released both when we're looking at the phone and when we're solving the puzzle. But the trigger to release dopamine comes much quicker and much more often with the phone. Dopamine triggers wanting, which leads to seeking. It makes us want to investigate new things and solve puzzles. The phone offers this in spades. New text messages and emails come every other second, reactivating our reward systems. The puzzle, on the other hand, isn't changing or getting solved anytime soon. Our natural reward system is optimized for novelty and the search for new information. Dopamine in the body's reward system are vital to our attention. Our body releases dopamine whenever it thinks there's a potential reward at the end of the rainbow. This gives us the motivation we need to achieve that reward. Rewards also have the unique ability to distract us, even long after the promise of a reward has disappeared. Brian Anderson, Patrick Laurent, and Stephen Yantis, neuroscientists at John Hopkins Universities, trained a group of, of participants to search for a red target or a green circle, circles, squares, etc. Among a sea of colorful shapes over the course of 1,000 trials. Every time the subjects identified the red or green target, they received a small amount of money, either a penny or a nickel, as a reward for the correct response. What they didn't know was that one group had an 80% chance of receiving a nickel and a 20% chance of receiving a penny, while the second group's reward probability was reversed. They only had a 20% chance of earning a nickel. Then the subjects were asked to complete 480 more trials in which they were asked to look for a unique shape in a sea of shapes. In this round, the participants received absolutely no reward. The shapes were never red or green for the control group. However, the other group had shapes of all colors, including red and green, the colors they had looked for in the previous experiment, but these were absolutely irrelevant in their current task of finding unique shapes. The fact that the second set of trials had no monetary reward didn't matter to subjects' attentional systems, though. Thanks to the monetary reward of the previous experiment, their response times slowed significantly in the shape-searching task. Their attention was now trained to focus on the red and green shapes automatically, thanks to their association with monetary rewards. In addition, the subjects with the higher monetary rewards from the first experiment were the slowest to react in the second. More money turned into more attention for red and green shapes, even though they had no monetary value in the second set of trials. The reward trigger activates our desire and motivation for a reward, the wanting mechanism. Once we want something, we pay attention until we achieve the reward we desire, the liking mechanism. The rewards we desire come in two flavors, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic rewards are tangible rewards we receive for accomplishing something. Things like money, food, trophies, and a perfect score on a test fall into this category. Intrinsic rewards, on the other hand, are the intangible rewards that provide us with feelings of internal satisfaction and accomplishment. It's the satisfaction and joy you feel when you nail your instrumental solo during a concert, or solve a difficult puzzle, or finish a great book. Just like rewards, the motivations we have to achieve those rewards can also be extrinsic or intrinsic. If you're reading Captivology because you will be quizzed on the book in class, you are extrinsically motivated because you're motivated by an extrinsic reward. However, if you're reading this book because you have a desire to learn and become more captivating, then you have intrinsic motivations because the reward for accomplishing the task is intangible and intrinsic. As we'll see throughout the rest of this chapter, both types of rewards and the motivations behind them have a powerful influence on people's attention, but the types of attention each reward affects are different. If you are looking to capture immediate and short attention, extrinsic rewards, like the pennies and nickels of the Johns Hopkins experiment, can be extremely effective. However, if you're looking to build loyalty and long attention, then an intrinsic rewards are far more helpful. Identifying the right rewards to activate the right motivations in the right situations is essential to using the reward trigger effectively. It's time to dive deeper into the two main types of rewards, starting with extrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards, or why you should wrap your money in bacon. 
Most companies offer a standard array of benefits and rewards to attract and retain employees. You're familiar with them. Health and dental insurance, pay raises, cash bonuses, vacation days, flexible scheduling, paid paternity leave, etc. But none of these particularly stand out. These are rewards that you can find at almost any company that cares about its employees. Even more luxurious bonuses like on-site meals, gym memberships, and massages are becoming more and more common among startups trying to catch the attention of in-demand engineers and designers. But there are, are a couple of companies that don't do the typical perks, and they stand out as more distinctive and thoughtful than the rest. Scopely, a Los Angeles-based mobile and social game publisher, decided to parody the Most Interesting Man in the World campaign from the popular Dos Equis commercials. Rather than simply giving recruits a cash bonus for joining the company, Scopely gave recruits and the people who referred them a briefcase filled with a year's supply of Dos Equis, a custom tuxedo, cigars, a spear gun, Sex Panther cologne, popularized in the movie Anchorman, an oil painting of the recruit, and last but not least, $11,000 in cash wrapped with bacon. Yes, bacon. Overboard? Sure. Effective? Absolutely. The company received more than a thousand resumes from the creative campaign and was able to convince multiple engineers from hyper-competitive Silicon Valley to move south for Scopely. Scopely used clear extrinsic rewards to capture attention and successfully recruit high-value employees. But any person or company can offer extrinsic rewards like cash and gifts, assuming they have those rewards on hand. What Scopely did was different, though, and it snowballed into a heap of attention. So why were its extrinsic rewards so attention-grabbing? We are used to extrinsic rewards in every facet of our life. Did your kid get a perfect score on her spelling test? Great, she gets a gold star and an A+. Did you outperform your sales projections? Great, you'll get a performance bonus. But in many cases, these run-of-the-mill extrinsic rewards only capture fleeting moments of attention. If-then rewards and extrinsic motivators like money and fame absolutely unequivocally get our attention, said Daniel Pink, the best-selling author of the book Drive, and also the book, To Sell is Human, in an interview. Quote, they get our attention, but in a very fixed way. They're extraordinarily effective at times. But there is a caveat to these types of rewards when it comes to attention. What rewards don't necessarily do is get our attention in a sustained way, because you have to offer another one in order to reclaim that attention, end quote. Extrinsic rewards work best to capture attention when you only need to get someone's attention once or twice to accomplish your goal. If you need to motivate your audience to recommend star employees for your company, extrinsic rewards work. But extrinsic rewards are far less effective once that star employee joins your company. A comprehensive analysis of multiple studies found that the correlation between money and job satisfaction is very weak. This is because intrinsic rewards like happiness, purpose, and self-satisfaction are better motivators than extrinsic ones like bonuses and vacation time, at least when it comes to long-term employment at, the, at a company. We clearly pay attention to tangible rewards for short-term tasks, but it's also clear that not all extrinsic rewards are equal when it comes to our attention. Plenty of companies offer referral and signing bonuses to attract engineering talent, but most of them aren't as adept as Scopely at using those rewards to captivate potential recruits. So, what separated Scopely's rewards from thousands of others? The answer isn't which extrinsic rewards Scopely offered, as one might expect, but the way in which Scopely presented those rewards. Researchers at Emory and Baylor universities, testing the impact of rewards on the pleasure centers of the brain, squirted either water, meh, or fruit juice, tasty, into the mouths of 25 subjects. In one run, subjects knew that the two drinks would alternate at fixed predictable intervals. In the other run, the order and timing of the sensations were randomized. As expected, the subjects in both runs experienced pleasure when they tasted the fruit juice, as its sweet taste activated their brain's nucleus accumbens, an area of the brain deeply involved in pleasure and reward. 
The MRI scans the researchers conducted, however, found that the subjects' pleasure centers became much more active for the subjects who participated in the randomized water or juice test. It didn't even matter whether the subjects preferred water or fruit juice. Either way, their brains would light up more intensely when they were surprised. Surprise and unpredictability are the keys here. The reward centers of the brain become more active when subjects were surprised by extrinsic rewards. The less predictable a reward is, the more pleasurable it becomes. If you recall from the chapter on the disruption trigger, our brain is wired to pay attention to anything that violates our expectations, so the correlation between surprise and rewards makes sense. In the case of Scopely, the company understood that everyone expected a cash bonus if they referred an engineer to the company. However, nobody expected to get that money wrapped in bacon. The fact that Scopely also included uncommon rewards like its, with its bacon-wrapped money like, when's the last time a company offered you a harpoon gun? This only enhanced the surprising nature of the primary reward, the $11,000 in cash, and thus enhanced the attention that Scopely received. We can safely conclude that uncommon extrinsic rewards capture people's attention because they surprise them, and people are wired to pay attention to surprises. Even if you're offering a common reward like money, Finding a creative, unique way to present those rewards will make them more attention-grabbing. But it's not just surprising extrinsic rewards that matter when it comes to capturing people's attention. How and when you deliver those rewards also matters. How to deliver extrinsic rewards Imagine you are running alongside the beautiful Sydney Harbor, trying to keep in shape while exploring Australia's largest city during a visit. You have your phone with you for the music, but you've also opened your favorite running app to track your miles and log your route so you know how to get back to any interesting sites. As you finish your run, you check and see that you broke 10 miles, absolutely one of the best runs. Your running app buzzes, congratulating you on your accomplishment. But, more importantly, it's just offered to send you a free pack of Gatorade and a pair of gym shorts for your achievement. Nice, you didn't even expect that at all. You were running for other reasons, but these rewards for your achievements made your day. This is the secret sauce of KIPP, a fast-growing platform for mobile rewards. If you're playing a puzzle game and you beat your friend's high score, a message powered by KIPP may just pop up, letting you know that you just earned a freebie, a discount, or some other type of achievement-based reward. Brands love it because it puts their product in front of targeted users during their happiest moments or moments of need and apps love it because it provides an extra dose of happiness for the user and a source of income that doesn't depend on banner ads. Brian Wong, the company's co-founder and CEO, said that there are two ways to offer somebody a reward. The first is one we're all familiar with, incentives. If you do something, I will give you something in return. Incentives are everywhere in the economy, through loyalty programs and added bonuses. Buy a credit card, and you'll get 25,000 miles free. The user is rewarded for changing their behavior. It's dangling a carrot. However, Brian Wong is not a fan of incentives, to say the least. It's essentially micro-bribery, he says. His company specializes in another type of reward, post-action rewards. This is when a user isn't expecting to, achieve it, to receive anything, but is given a serendipitous reward for an achievement. It not only surprises the user, activating the pleasure centers of their brain, as we just learn, learned, but it also treats people as human beings with worth, rather than as Pavlovian dogs that can be trained. Consumers respond much more highly to something that isn't dangled in front of their face as an incentive, said Wong. Are people more motivated by a surprising reward based on achievement rather than an incentive? KIPP measured how many consumers responded to incentives versus post-action rewards. When KIPP offered a reward as an incentive, they found that less than 15% of consumers redeemed the reward that KIPP offered. But when the product offered a serendipitous reward, one offered after an, ach an achievement, the redemption rate grew to north of 20%. Okay, it's not much more. That, that's a big difference if you're trying to get your product in the hands of potential customers, and it's a far less intrusive method for reaching a target audience. 
Perhaps that's why more than 350 brands and 2,100 apps are using KIPP. In the original behavior of, sorry, quote, in the original version of rewarding and loyalty, it was to define the behavior, but now it's about the behavior defining the, re the reward, end quote, explains Wong. There are many ways to give somebody an extrinsic reward. Yu Kai Chao, an expert at gamification, a discipline that breaks game mechanics and rewards to increase user engagement, breaks reward delivery into six categories. We've already learned about two types, incentives, offering a reward in return for completing a specific action, and post-action rewards, providing an unexpected reward after completing a specific action. But there are a few others that Chow outlines. Collections, giving users only a piece of the overall reward in the hopes that they will be incentivized to complete the collection. For example, McDonald's has done this for years with its Monopoly game, where you have to collect two to three separate pieces to qualify to win everything, from a vacation to a million dollars. Lottery, offering a reward based on chance. Random rewards. Users know they will receive a reward after completing a task, but don't know what that reward will be. This is different than KIPP's post-action rewards, which never promise you that you'll receive a reward after completing an action. Instead, KIPP's rewards are a total surprise. Gifting. Having other users give you a reward. This is used all the time in social games like Candy Crush Saga, Farmville, and their successors. Users can, users can send their friends extra lives or special items. This is clever because these rewards could just as easily come from the game itself. But instead of this approach, but instead this approach involves your friends, giving you the feeling of validation. All six ways of giving rewards, incentives, post-action rewards, collections, lottery, random rewards, and gifting, these all captivate users in the right situations. A random reward is captivating because users don't know what they're going to get. Surprise! On the other hand, gifting is effective because people feel validated by friends giving them gifts, a concept we will discuss further in the chapter on the acknowledgement trigger. The main lesson to draw here, though, is that surprising somebody with a reward is more effective at capturing attention than offering a fixed reward. Anytime you can add a level of unpredictability to a, unpredictability to a reward, you should. Post-action rewards and random rewards are most effective methods for delivering rewards in this case. Now, we've covered the power of extrinsic rewards on our attention, but did I say earlier that extrinsic rewards are limited to capturing immediate and short attention? When you need to capture sustained attention that lasts over the course of months or years, this is long attention, intrinsic rewards are the way to go. To better understand why intrinsic rewards captivate our attention over the long term, let's turn our attention to a Canadian hero. Intrinsic rewards are how one man's motivation changed the world. In the 1970s, a curly-haired college athlete returning home crashed into a pickup truck, totaling his car. He was okay except for a sore knee. That soreness would come and go until around 1977, when he could no longer ignore the pain and went to the hospital. He received a far more somber diagnosis than he expected. Cancer. More specifically, doctors diagnose him with osteosarcoma, an aggressive tumor that often starts in the bones of the legs and the knees. The doctors had to amputate his leg in order to save him. If you're a Canadian, this story will be familiar. In 1979, Terry Fox, now outfitted with an artificial leg, began training his body. He started with a half mile on the track at Hastings Junior High School. Then a week later, he ran his first mile. Through the training, pain, and countless blisters, Fox persevered and his strength grew, despite his chemotherapy. By the end of the year, he completed his first marathon, eliciting cheers from the crowd. But his real plan had just begun. His true goal, run across all of Canada in order to raise awareness and a million dollars for cancer research. Even his mother thought he was nuts, but he insisted. Inspired by Fox's story, Ford of Canada gave him a camper van, Adidas gave him running shoes, 
and other sponsors came out of the woodwork, offering flights, gas money, and living expenses. The Canadian Cancer Society agreed to help promote the run. I've seen a lot of disability, people who were really shut in and away from life and couldn't do anything, Fox told the Montreal Gazette. I want to show that that just because they're disabled, it's not the end. In fact, it's more of a challenge. In April of 1980, his run across Canada began. Despite gale force winds and lack of visibility in the beginning, he pushed forward, running approximately a full marathon's length in every day. Porto Basque, Nova Scotia, Montreal. And while the donations weren't rolling in just yet, he continued. Eventually, he caught the attention of Isidore Sharp, the founder of the Four Seasons Hotel chain, who had lost his son to cancer just two years prior. He and his company rallied hundreds of other corporations to donate $2 per mile that Fox ran, and this kept Fox going. Thus, he kept running. His story kept spreading. People were finally turning out for Fox. 10,000 people rallied for the marathoner when he made it to Toronto, raising $100,000 in a single day for cancer research. In Ontario, hockey legend Bobby Orr presented him with a $25,000 check. The endeavor captured the attention and hearts of not just Canadians, but people all across the world. By the time his journey ended 143 days later, Terry Fox's Marathon of Hope had changed the game for cancer research. And while he never made it across Canada, his, raise, his run raised $1.7 million. A national telethon organized a week later in his honor helped raise an astounding $10.5 million more. The cancer and his amazing run took their toll on his body, though. By June of 1981, Fox had developed pneumonia and passed away. An entire nation mourned. Fox's Marathon of Hope made cancer research a priority. The Terry Fox Run, an event that now spans four continents, continues to raise millions to fight cancer. So why did Terry Fox capture the hearts and minds of millions of Canadians during his run? More importantly, why is his work still making an impact decades after his death? For Fox's supporters, they were rewarded for their commitment with long-term personal satisfaction and the knowledge that they had helped make the world better. There was no short-term reward for their support. Even the actual goal of Fox's Marathon of Hope, to find a cure for cancer, is still a long way from fruition. No amount of short-term extrinsic rewards was going to motivate the Canadian people to keep paying attention. Quote, what 50 years of social science tells us very clearly is that if-then rewards are pretty effective for simple, short kinds of tasks, Daniel Pink explained during our interview. What they don't necessarily do is get our attention in a sustained way, because you have to offer another one in order to reclaim that attention, end quote. If-then rewards are extrinsic rewards, specifically incentives. If you do something, then you get a reward in return. We already know that if you want someone to pay attention to a single task or idea, extrinsic rewards can be effective. But once a task or idea becomes more complicated, extrinsic rewards lose their effectiveness. This is because receiving a reward completes the dopamine opioid cycle of wanting and liking. Once we have our extrinsic reward, there is no longer any incentive to continue to pay attention. To restart the cycle, Pink said, you have to offer another reward. Pink said that organizations also use incentive rewards too often. The, resort, the result that, that work is that work gets done, but employees have no reason to excel, and job satisfaction tanks. Imagine a workplace where you had no companionship and no love for your job or your company's business. The only reason you stuck around was because of the salary and the bonuses. But these are just enough to get you to do the minimum work. You have no additional incentive to go above and beyond the call of duty. I suspect a fair number of you have experienced this scenario once in your life or have a friend in this situation. It's a terrible work environment for employees and a terrible way for employers to conduct business. A study conducted by Dr. James Harder, Gallup's chief scientist of workplace management and well-being, found low job satisfaction was correlated with a future drop in the bottom line. In other words, unhappy employees eventually lead to declining profits. This is where intrinsic rewards come into the picture. 
They are the intangible, internalized feelings of satisfaction and joy we feel when we accomplish something or do something we love. When I was a kid, I would read books about outer space and the solar system in the library. I was a true nerd. But I didn't devour these books because I had a test. I read these books for the sake of learning. I did it because I inherently enjoyed learning about how comets and stars form. The difference between extrinsic and intrinsic rewards is all in the motivations we have to achieve each type of reward. Extrinsic rewards motivate us to do something or to pay attention to something in order to receive that reward. We will listen to our teachers get good grades or work overtime for extra money. But intrinsic rewards are for their own sake. We're motivated to pay attention or take action because something is simply worth doing, and we don't really care if we earn any extrinsic reward for our effort. The key here is that our motivation to achieve intrinsic rewards like satisfaction is a long-term phenomenon. We know that we cannot master chess or piano in a single sitting. It takes years of dedication, but many of us master these skills anyway. Our brain develops a long-term relationship with the things that motivate us intrinsically. This long-term motivation, activated by the wanting mechanism of the dopamine system, makes us pay attention to the things that will help us achieve the intrinsic rewards we crave. Thus, if you help provide people with the motivation to achieve an intrinsic reward, you also capture their attention. Quote, progress in the world comes down to motivating other people and motivating oneself, end quote, said Sheryl Sandberg, the author of Lean In and the COO of Facebook. When I interviewed her, I asked her what she thought the key to capturing attention was, and her reply was simple, motivation. Intrinsic motivation leads us to intrinsic rewards that will make us pay attention to things that no amount of extrinsic rewards could ever provide. Take Canada's reaction to Terry Fox as an example. There were no tangible rewards for Canadians to support his cause and donate. Donors didn't get job promotions for their donations. Instead, the rewards were intrinsic. The satisfaction that their donations were going toward a worthy champion and a worthy cause was more than enough of a reward. Plus, there is something inherently joyful and satisfying about supporting an underdog like Fox. I know I feel joy when I hear about an underdog overcoming the odds to succeed. How to deliver intrinsic rewards. It's clear that the right intrinsic rewards lead to long-term attention, but what qualifies as an intrinsic reward? And how can you provide intrinsic rewards to motivate others and get them to pay attention? You can't simply offer an intrinsic reward to somebody like you can offer money or other extrinsic rewards. Intrinsic rewards come from a person's internal desires. It boils down to two questions. What gives your audience personal satisfaction? And what does your audience like to do just for the sake of doing it? While the answers to these questions vary, there are a couple of intrinsic motivators that are, in common, in general, common across all people. Ohio State University Professor Emeritus Stephen Rice, for example, places intrinsic motivations in 16 categories. Whew, get ready. Power, independence, curiosity, acceptance from others, order, saving or collecting, honor, idealism or social justice, social, social contact or having friends, family, status, vengeance, romance, eating, physical activity, and tranquility or safety. Rice is not the only one who has categorized intrinsic motivators. Daniel Pink also believes that there are three key motivations that drive our behavior and our decisions autonomy, the freedom of self-direction, mastery, becoming better at something, and purpose, knowing why you're doing something, rather than simply how to do it, Pink said. These are poignant and powerful motivations, especially when it comes to providing motivation in the workplace. Phew, that's a lot of motivations. Before you start highlighting the section and memorizing all these different motivations, let me make something clear. All these motivations are simply different paths people take to achieve an intrinsic reward. It's important to make the distinction between intrinsic ward rewards and intrinsic motivations. Intrinsic rewards are simply the happiness and satisfaction we feel from personal accomplishment. Intrinsic motivations, e.g. 
mastery, honor, social contact, these are the reasons we have for taking action. In this case, to achieve an intrinsic reward. Some people feel that a sense of satisfaction, or some people feel that sense of satisfaction by hanging out with their friends. Others find it when they find purpose in their career. And yet others feel joy as they feed their curiosities. Well, so while there are many paths to an, ex to an intrinsic reward, the most important thing that you can do is to give that to your audience and thus capture their attention, is to understand the key motivators of your audience and then help facilitate their journey to an intrinsic reward. You can't give somebody personal satisfaction in their job, for example, but you can give them the freedom they need to achieve that intrinsic reward. Google's famous 20%, where engineers have the freedom to spend up to a day per week on a project of their joy, promotes autonomy, independence, and curiosity, all motivators that lead to intrinsic rewards. In the 1980s, when Ricardo Semler took over as CEO of Brazil's Semco company, or Semco Group, a manufacturer at the time, he instituted a series of radical policies. He eliminated organizational charts, timesheets, job titles, and expensive micromanagers. The result is that Semco has grown from $4 million per year to north of $200 million per year in a little over two decades. Without all the restrictions present in many other companies, Semco's employees were free to innovate and flourish. They were given the opportunity to achieve intrinsic rewards, and that translated into millions of sales. For the previous few sections, we've covered the two types of rewards in depth, but we still haven't talked about another important component of the reward trigger. How do you make somebody desire a reward? How do you activate the wanting mechanism? To answer that, we will have to take a trip to Thailand. Seeing is wanting. What would you do if a boy and girl, both six years old, walked up to you with cigarettes in their mouths, asking for a light? Two Thai children in Bangkok did exactly that. Can I get a light? The, women, the children asked two young women with cigarettes in their hands. One of the women replied, they drill a hole in your throat. Aren't you afraid of surgery? The little girl replied, if you, or sorry, then she, the woman continued, you know it's bad, right? Smoking causes lung cancer and emphysema. The children simply reply, if it's so bad, then why are you smoking? The kids then hand the adults a piece of paper that says, you worry about me, but why not about yourself? And walk away. The children weren't actually smokers. It was actually a campaign called Smoking Kid for the Thai Health Promotion Foundation. In the two and a half minute video, the children subtly remind strangers on the street of the true dangers of smoking. They make the dangers of smoking real by asking the adults for a light. It's one thing to be given statistics about smoking. It's another to actually see children with cigarettes in their hands. The video, created by Ogilvy and Mather, was a sensation from the moment of its debut. It generated over 5 million views and 20,000 anti-smoking comments on YouTube in just 10 days, and it was hailed by everyone from Upworthy to Reuters in the, to the local Thai news as one of the best anti-smoking ads ever. More importantly, though, phone calls to the Thai Health Promotion Foundation's smoking hotline increased by 40%. The children with cigarettes in their mouths proved a vivid visual cue that triggered the wanting response, or, I want to be healthy, I want to quit. Thousands of people saw both the consequences of smoking and the rewards of quitting. All of this motivated people to call the hotline. So how they did, and how do you, or how did they, and how do you, activate the wanting mechanism that activates our attention? The answer is imagery, because imagery motivates people to go after rewards more intensely than any other motivator. We are horrendous at visualizing statistics or abstract goals, but if you show someone a picture of a chocolate chip cookie or a starving child, imagery, you are far more likely to catch their attention. Dr. Kent Barrage says, quote, when we think vividly of a reward, it activates the reward system directly. The worst thing an addict should do is to vividly imagine that drug. The wanting grows, end quote. Visualizing a reward whether it's an extrinsic or intrinsic reward, is among the best ways to increase your audience's desire and attention for that reward. So Parnell Rajaram and Mary Ellen Hamilton, researchers at SUNY Stony Brook and St. Peter's University, respectively, 
asked a group of 83 students to look at a list of 80 words. For half of the words, they were asked to simply read each word that appeared on the screen. These were the non-imaged set. For the other set of words, however, the subjects were asked to form a mental image of the word before moving on. This is the imaged set. The subjects were next tested with 80 general knowledge questions and told the questions were related to a different experiment. Half of the questions had answers unrelated to the first study. However, the other half of the general knowledge questions had target answers that subjects had encountered in the earlier study. Of these 40 questions, half came from the non-imaged word set, and the other half came from the imaged word set. When Rajaram and Hamilton tallied up the results, they found that the students had a far greater percentage of right answers, about 45%, for the, for the questions related to the imaged words, than for either the non-imaged, about 30%, or the new words, about 25%. Just imagining the words helped significantly with both memory and recognition. This effect is well known among teachers and academics. The imagery effect, visualizing an object or goal, can trigger the reward system by making the goal more tangible. In other words, imagining yourself crossing the finish line makes you more determined to actually complete the race. More effective than even visualization, though, is actually being able to see the fruits of your labor, showing somebody the actual reward or providing a tangible equivalent. We are bad at grasping esoteric concepts, but easily motivated when we actually see the reward right in front of us. Dan Ariely, a behavioral economic economist at Duke University, asked a group of male Harvard students to build models out of bionicle Legos. The first time each subject built one of the models, or 40 pieces with instructions, he was paid $2. If the subject decided to build a second Lego model, he was paid $1.89, or 11 cents less than the first. The reward for the third model was 11 cents less than the second reward, $1.78, and continued to descend until the reward, re reward reached 2 cents. All the Lego sets were identical. What the subjects didn't know was that they were divided into two groups, Meaningful and Sisyphus. Students in the Meaningful camp were asked to place each completed Lego model on the desk in front of them before they were given a new box of Legos. The models would pile up on the table as they built more. The subjects of the Sisyphus condition, however, only had two boxes of Legos. Each time a subject completed a set, it was disassembled in front of him by the experimenter while they worked on the other box. In other words, the models didn't accumulate on the table like the students in the meaningful condition. What do you think happened? Despite the task being identical for both groups, the subjects in the meaningful condition built an average of 10.6 Lego sets, a reward of $14.40. The Sisyphus camp, however, stopped building far earlier than the first group. They built an average of 7.2 uh, sets before quitting, a reward of just $11.52. Just the mere presence or destruction of their work changed their behavior. Subjects who could see the fruits of their labors focused significantly longer on building bionicle Lego sets, and watching them get their work or watching their work get destroyed deterred them from building further. In this example, there was an extrinsic and an intrinsic reward. The extrinsic reward was a cash prize, but the intrinsic reward was the sense of accomplishment that each group felt after completing a Lego set. The Sisyphus group didn't get much time to feel that sense of accomplishment, though, because their creations kept getting disassembled. This clearly drained them of their motivation to work longer. Reminding people of what they have accomplished or what they can accomplish is another way of helping them visualize an intrinsic reward and drive attention further. As for the extrinsic reward, I suspect that if Ariely had added money to a pile on the table each time a group completed a Lego set, the subjects would have been more motivated to build additional Lego sets. This would have helped subjects visualize what they were earning. The more visually enticing or concrete the reward you present, whether it's an extrinsic reward like money, or like food or money, or an intrinsic one like achievement, the more motivation people feel to capture that reward. This, in turn, leads to more attention. Applying Ariely, Rajaram, and Hamilton's research in social and business contexts is a different story, of course. But the masters of attention have learned to do just that. 
How to Get People to Walk Through Your Doors Las Vegas, the city of sin, is not the place it used to be. For the latter half of the 20th century, tourists embarked to Vegas because of the cards, slot machines, shows, and Frank Sinatra's crooning voice. And while the live shows and the countless gambling options are still a big attraction in Vegas, the 21st century has seen a new type of customer begin to dominate. This customer, the clubber, is coming to Vegas for the food, the liquor, and the DJs who rock the pure and marquee nightclubs in high heels and sport coats. This shift has changed the way casinos attract customers and build out their revenue. At Caesars Entertainment, which owns Bally's, Flamingo, Paris, Planet Hollywood, Caesars Palace, and many more casinos and hotels worldwide, it's been up to Tariq Shokat, its chief marketing officer, to figure out not how to not only survive the change, but to thrive in it too. We're very big believers in the idea that you should try to identify and focus on persuadable customers, Shokat said. According to Shokat, a persuadable customer is someone who is in the market for something at a particular time, but looking. Imagine you're on this strip and you're in the mood for Italian, but you don't know which restaurant to pick. At the moment they're thinking about it, that's when they're in a persuadable moment, the Caesar CMO said. We focus on being in front of them at those moments. In other words, Caesars focuses on getting in front of consumers when they crave rewards the most. If Caesars knows that you like to play poker, don't be surprised when someone from VIP calls you to offer a seat. If you're more of the clubbing type, though, Caesars might help you out with that first bottle before you have a chance to hop to a rival casino's club. How does Caesars get in front of consumers at the right time? First, Shokat said, Caesars focuses on being present. It utilizes advertising, Google searches, magazines, and unique publicity to remind its target audience of their favorite things about Caesars, its hotels, and its casinos. As we've already learned, showing people a visual representation of a reward increases their motivation and attention for that reward. If you live for live shows, Caesars will make sure that you know which one is being featured with images of its performers suspended on billboards. The second way Caesars gets in front of its customers is through identifying when its customers are most likely to want and desire the rewards it offers. This level of targeting has only recently been possible, thanks to the proliferation of mobile devices. Caesars is using social media and mobile apps to reach out to consumers when they are actually interested. If you post a picture of The Britney Show on Twitter, for example, you might get a message from the Caesars social team about the club party she's hosting. They know that this is a reward you will jump at the chance to acquire. Caesars will even send you discounts and rewards based on your location and tastes. In this respect, Caesars applies a lesson we learned from Brian Wong and Kip. Instead of trying to change behavior with, with a reward, Kip surprises customers with post-action rewards, which creates greater loyalty. It's the difference between a customer and a loyal customer. A customer drops by a restaurant, is satisfied, and doesn't think about it again. A loyal customer comes into a restaurant, receives special treatment they didn't expect, and comes back because they've built a positive relationship in that business. This is why, Shakat said, Caesars hosts have a wide scope of discretion. The goal is to give its customers the reward they want at the moment they want it. They focus on building relationships and rewarding existing behaviors rather than making a relationship feel transactional. Caesars finds a way both to let potential customers know that Caesars has the rewards they want and to surprise its loyal customers with rewards as well. Balancing intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. When McDonald's first introduced healthier items to its menu, Caesar salad, fruit and yogurt parfait, grilled chicken sandwich wrap, it was hailed as an important step toward reducing the consumption of empty calories and the fast growing problem of childhood obesity. But despite consumer outcry about the traditional menu, thanks to the documentary Super Size Me, and demand for the healthier menu, sales of its salad and healthy items have remained flat. Why? Certainly one reason is that people don't go to McDonald's to get a salad. They go to McDonald's to get a Big Mac and fries. But Dr. Gavin Fitzsimmons, a marketing and psychology professor at Duke's Fukua School of Business, found another interesting reason why healthy items at the fast food giant didn't sell. Fitzsimmons and his collaborators recruited 104 students, 
measured their level of self-control, and asked them to look over a menu of boot options, each of which was the same price. One, menu had a men one group had a menu with french fries, chicken nuggets, and a baked potato. The other group had four items on the menu, an extra one, the salad. Students in the first group chose the fries, rated by the students two weeks prior as the last healthy option, about 50% of the time if they had low self-control, and 10% of the time if they had high levels of self-control. The second group, the one with the salad on the menu, was a different story, though. Individuals with high levels of self-control actually chose the fries more often than their counterparts. When given a menu with a healthy option, students with high levels of self-control chose the fries nearly 50% of the time. Adding a healthy option to the menu actually increased the likelihood that the students would choose to eat the french fries. Not only that, but Fitzsimmons and his colleagues also found that the amount of time and attention with the students with high self-control gave toward the fries increased significantly when the researchers added a salad to the menu. Healthy menu options can actually backfire. Add a salad to the menu and you'll pay more attention to the least healthy option more. The reason, Fitzsimmons and company concluded, is something he calls vicarious goal fulfillment. Oftentimes, we have to make a choice between an, ex an intrinsic reward and an extrinsic one. We derive pleasure from the salty taste of fries. This is tangible so it's an extrinsic reward. But we also seek to lose weight and feel good about ourselves when we wear swimsuits at the beach. The positive and intangible feelings of accomplishment and self-satisfaction are intrinsic. In the case of the McDonald's experiment, our wanting for each reward, extrinsic pleasure from tasty food and intrinsic pleasure from healthy eating, are mutually exclusive. Very few people can lose weight on the diet of, big, of french fries and Big Macs. But the brain can be tricked into thinking that it can have its cake and eat it too. When a healthy option appears on the menu filled with junk food, our brain fe feels a sense of accomplishment for having just the opportunity to accomplish our intrinsic goal of healthy eating. Merely having the option to accomplish a goal is enough of a reward that we are more likely to indulge in an extrinsic reward. Offering a choice actually becomes counterproductive if your goal is to get somebody to choose a healthier option. I find the results of this study fascinating because they exemplify the different motivators we have to achieve extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. A study conducted by researchers from the University of Chicago determined that if you show somebody healthy and unhealthy foods, they will immediately prefer the unhealthy option. But as time passes and they have time to think about it, their preference will switch to the healthy one. Extrinsic rewards like fries and unhealthy food motivate us on a short-term basis and affect our short-term attention and decision-making. We ignore the long-term implications of eating fries, like weight gain, heart disease, and so on, and focus on the salty, fatty taste that gives so many of us immediate satisfaction. Our brain, sensing that it can achieve an immediate extrinsic reward through french fries, focuses its efforts on achieving that short-term reward at the cost of the long-term, intrinsic reward of self-satisfaction. It can take a lot of self-control to resist the temptation of a short-term reward. Our brain is wired to find the path of least resistance to a reward when possible. This is why extrinsic rewards are ideal for immediate and short attention, and why so many of us succumb to our cravings for McDonald's. On the other hand, if we can exhibit self-control, our attention and decisions will focus on long-term or intrinsic rewards. This is why intrinsic rewards are a tool for capturing long attention. Throughout this chapter, we've discussed the power of dopamine, which gives us motivation and wanting for specific rewards. And we've discussed the two types of rewards and the impact they have on all three levels of our attention. The rewards that motivate us differ from person to person, but in the end, it really does come down to one thing, a reward to solve somebody's problem. In the immediate term, money and extrinsic rewards solve problems like hunger, short-term pleasure, and the ability to buy your wife something nice. But over the long term, our motivations are intrinsic. Will I be successful? Will I find love? Will I get the respect that I deserve? The key to capturing attention with the reward trigger is using extrinsic and intrinsic rewards in the right situations and discovering the motivations your audience have for achieving those rewards. 
Finding the right balance between extrinsic and intrinsic rewards means the difference between happy employees who stick with your company and disgruntled ones who never achieve their potential. The key is helping solve people's short-term problems while giving them the opportunity to build themselves in the long term. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.